Bread Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Welcome to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss, and we are at High V in the club room. This is really our holiday show. Well, we've had so, so many holiday shows anyway, but we're having another holiday show, and we have Indian Hills Culinary Arts students with us. We have Keller Kinsler. Kelly is busy doing what? I'm working on cooking the vegetables for the couscous that we are going to make. It's strictly vegetarian couscous today. A vegetarian couscous. Okay, and what else is on the menu? Um, we also have some Christmas mice that I'm going to be making. Are we? Are we? We're actually eating those or exterminating them? Um, I'm going to catch them and cook them up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They're going to be completely made out of chocolate, maraschino cherries, and little slivered almonds for the little ears. They're going to be really cute. Okay, so we're we're going to get to that those maraschino cherries in a little bit, and then let's see. We have some. I think I saw some kind of cabbage rolls or something. Right, Savannah, Savannah Strode, you put some cabbage rolls already in the oven, is that right? Yes, I did. (laughs) Savannah, as you know, is a woman of very few words. Okay, tell us a little bit about the cabbage rolls. Well, it is ground beef, onion soup mix, (laughs) um, stewed tomatoes, tomato juice, rice, and seasonings. Okay. These girls know I'm going to give them some trouble as we get into the show about some of their ingredients. Now, what else? Is there anything else? There's something else, right? What's this over here? I see celery chopped up, and I see vegetable broth. So what's going to happen? We're also going to be making a turkey dressing that is just your normal stuffing with turkey in it. So, <laughs> But perfect for a holiday dinner like or lunch, as far as that's concerned. All right, Tom Allen is with us. And, Tom, do you have some special music for us? Yeah, this is uh, Angels from the Realms of Glory and just a solo guitar version. So here we go. Are there angels from other realms other than the realms of glory? Yeah, that's kind of part of the problem that we have to deal with. <laughs> like, the angels we don't want that cause trouble, we have to treat them like the mice and... And exterminate them. Okay, so, yeah, so all right, let's hear it. This is the Angels from the Realms. Of, it's a Christmas carol that goes way back. beautiful thank you thank you very much it's really a pleasure to have you We're so much enjoy you especially when you play your humorous music but <laughs> well, i think this is a perfect holiday treat so so uh, have a happy holiday and a happy yeah, new year to you wonderful one to you too and uh, with gustatory delights and uh, not adding inches to your waist and your hips we've got a brand new uh, theme music coming out in january which has some kind of attitude to it, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. Worked on it, and Tim Britton did some, uh, and we got some women in there singing and me singing, and it's quite the bells and whistles. 
Looking forward to it. That sounds good. We, we always need a, a facelift here on Great Taste, okay? All right. So now let's get over here, and, and uh, I see I had no idea what Christmas mice were, and now that I see what they really are, I think that possibly decon might be the best best uh, thing that we could do with them <laughs> but but uh I, I they are celebrate celebratory all right so and cute so who wants to tell me a little bit about christmas mice and where where in the world did christmas mice come from okay well we learned about these last year around the holiday season from chef mary um she taught us how to do them and we really liked them so well they are really cute and they actually are they look like mice and so how, how do you make that happen well you dip the maraschino cherry in chocolate and then you attach the kiss so yeah. you've got one hershey's kiss or you've got one half of a her no you've got a whole hershey's kiss as the head right yeah. two slivered almonds as the ears and then the body and the tail is the maraschino cherry and then they are sitting on what is that horrible thing they're sitting on <laughs> it's not horrible it's an oreo cookie <laughs> oh, I, I heard I heard Kelly say, no, it's not horrible, it's disgusting. <laughs> she just hates Oreos. And it's a mint Oreo, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. pretty good. Pretty good. Uh -huh. Okay. So now that brings us, okay, so Christmas mice, this is something you can decorate your table with. Um, I, heart, uh, <laughs> I, am, I don't know whether to be embarrassed that I'm emceeing this show or not, but it's definitely a first for all of us to be uh, having this kind of food on our show, Great Taste, which is so much a show about local foods and about eating healthy and about eating non-genetically modified foods and all those kinds of things. And here I am staring at oh, a bowl see. of... Lighten up, right? Holiday season. Come on. It's the holidays. <laughs> so, okay. So what does that mean to you? Junk food? I'm in college. I'm poor. It's cheap, easy, and fun. <laughs> you know what? Okay. But that it's still it's still it's still it how about the fact that you can have junk food or junk like junk food that is healthy and still fun? What do you think about that? I like it. I could always Stand to eat healthier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that brings up a really good point because one of the things that I wanted to discuss were some of the most interesting things that I thought that uh, I've encountered this year, especially in relation to the show. And as far as that's concerned, we've done a couple of shows this year with Liana Warner Gray. And Liana Warner Gray is the founder of The Earth Diet. You can find her website's theearthdiet.org. And one of the things that she did, so this might be an interesting exercise is that she was a junk food addict and decided to get herself healthy and realized that she didn't really want to do it in a way unless she didn't want to do it if she had to essentially not enjoy the foods that she was eating because cheesecake for example is her favorite mm -hmm. food so what her mission was part of it anyway was to actually develop recipes that could serve as fun and delicious, but still, you know, kind of feed that crave, that mm -hmm. junk food crave. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I mean, I can live without junk food for a while. I love fruits and veggies, but there's always that craving in the pit of your stomach. You got to have chocolate or something. So I don't know if I'd be able to get over that. You don't have to. That's the whole idea. So that, that's the whole thing is that, for example, you can take care of that craving by feeding it, we'll say, a more pure form of chocolate, for example. And what you'll find, I think this is what, what, what you do find, is that the better the chocolate that you eat, the less you actually need to consume because it's so satisfying. Like, uh, no offense to Hershey's Kisses, but you got to eat a lot of them because they really just don't have any substance to them. Sugar. You're, right, it's just a bunch of sugar with um, inferior cocoa beans and and do they even use cocoa beans who knows uh but anyway th that's one of the cool things is that you discover that really great foods have 
that ability to satisfy with less. And that's, that, that's one of the, the things that I've enjoyed. Now, do you believe me? Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's, that's really good. Okay. So by the time everybody listens to this show, because the show will be played, I think it airs on December 25th, actually. Oh, my. The show airs on December 25th. Uh, anyway, the, one of the great restaurants in Iowa will have shuttered. Lincoln Cafe, its last service is on December 21st. Matt Steigerwald, chef and owner of Lincoln Cafe, closing the cafe after 12 years because of numerous reasons. I think that uh, he's stated in, in articles in the newspaper. But the bottom line is that it's tough. You know, being a chef, we've talked about it on the show many, many times. Being a chef is a very, and running your own restaurant is a very difficult job. It's a job that requires you to be all in all the time. And it's a job generally that younger people find easier to manage. Matt's 47, and I think that uh, he thought the time was, has come for other challenges. So I just want to say hats off to Matt. Fantastic. Thanks for helping out in terms of the Iowa food scene for all these years. But here's the great news. You can still get the best pizza in Iowa at the Lincoln Wine Bar, which is also owned by Matt Steigerwald. And the Lincoln Wine Bar is not going anywhere, and it's going to continue serving plenty of great pizza. And that is one of the greatest things that I've enjoyed this year in terms of going out to eat, is going and finding this fantastic pizza only a little over an hour and a half away from our little town of Fairfield, Iowa. And that's some of the best pizza within thousands of miles. Thanks again, Matt. And we really appreciate what you've done for the local food scene in Iowa. Some other things that I wanted to mention to you about, I, I hear the sizzling, so maybe we should find out what, what the sizzling is all about here. That's, is that turkey? Yes, it's ground turkey for the stuffing. And the stuffing, is this, is this something that can be used as a, a main dish, or is it actually something that has to go inside a turkey? You can use it as a main dish. Um, a lot of people use it as a filler for the turkey, but... You don't need I'm, it. I'm turning you around so the people who see you on FMC, Fairfield Media Center, can actually see you. Those of us on the ra- those of us who are listening on the radio, the, the radio listeners don't have to see you, but the the TV uh, crew might want to. All right, go back to the stuffing. Um, I've never really used it or made it without putting it in a turkey before, but I figured I'd try something different. So. Okay. Hey, speaking about turkeys, did you get to make the turkey at Thanksgiving? I did. My mom helped me um, because I wasn't able to be there um, to start it off a couple days in advance. But she was there and started it in the brine, and then I got to roast it off. And And what did everybody think? They loved it. It, They said it was the best turkey they've had ever. (laughs) Oh, and how did your mom feel about that? She she was okay with it (laughs) because she helped, so... (laughs) Okay, after how many years it was the best turkey? And so she, she's glad that uh, you're doing what you're doing, which is going to culinary school. Definitely. Her and my dad both. <laughs> it's always nice to keep the parents happy. I know that as a father. Uh, I definitely know it's important to keep the parents happy. All right. So let, let's go on to another of uh, my favorite things that I found this year because it is it's the end of the year, so we might as well wrap some stuff up, right? So bari, Bariani olive oil. Terrific olive oil from California, made by an Italian guy, and really just very, very full-bodied olive oil, an olive oil that has a a real strength to it, and it'll bite you. So I like that kind of stuff. I'm not really into subtlety too much in terms of olive oil, that's for sure. And so Bariani olive oil, and along with the Bariani olive oil, he also makes a truffle oil which is extraordinary. Most truffle oils, uh, we've spoken about it before, are chemically synthesized. Basically, scientists go, they've been able to find the active, whatever it is, pheromone or anything, uh, pheromones and whatever they are that that, uh, actually create the different tastes and smells in foods. And so most truffle oil, white truffle oil, is chemically developed. And even the ones that are really good uh, truffle oils, uh, generally, even if they have some white truffle in them, 
they usually have, you'll find in, uh, if you read the ra label, it says truffle aroma or uh, that type of thing. So this one is strictly Bariani olive oil and white truffles that he has flown in from Italy and that are put into the truffle oil and, and sit in there for as long as he feels it's necessary to impart the aroma and the taste. And I can tell you something else which is really fantastic, and that is that it lasts for a long time too. It's not something that when you open it, that it dissipates really quickly. As long as you keep that bottle closed, it'll last for a couple of months. And so Bariani olive oil, you can find it, you can find it on the web. Uh, something that I recommend as, as a wonderful everyday olive oil to use and an olive oil that will perk up a lot of different things that uh, you can use it on in your kitchen. Best book that I read this year, food book. Not the best book that I read. Best food book. Restaurant Man by Joe Bastianich. Joe Bastianich is Mario Batali's partner in many different restaurants in New York, Las Vegas, uh, all over the world. I think they probably have a restaurant in Japan. Who knows where, where all the restaurants are that they have. Anyway, this book is a book that is, is pretty raw. He, he doesn't uh, hold anything back. He comes from a restaurant family, so it's interesting to, to hear him talk about his father's restaurant, an Italian restaurant in the city, and when he was growing up and he worked at the restaurant and all the different things that went on. And very, very interesting then to see how he parlayed that knowledge into working with Mario Batali to develop one of the best restaurant groups in the world today. They are a company that is very, very uh, different than most in the fact that they've been able to maintain their quality no matter the location. Now, I certainly haven't eaten at all of the locations that they have, but I've eaten at many of them, and it's quite extraordinary how good uh, those each restaurant is, and they've maintained the integrity of the company, which is to use just the best ingredients. And in Las Vegas, for example, Oto, which is one of the restaurants, actually is a certified green restaurant. So hats off to them. Really, really uh, uh, terrific book. Very interesting book if you want to get a look into the restaurant industry. One of the things that, that I learned in, in, in that book was that uh, what I thought was a tough industry is a lot tougher. So it's not for the faint of heart, which I think is interesting because I'm wondering about you guys. How much longer do you have in school? Uh, about five months. Five more months. And then do you have a particular plan? Well, hopefully with how my internship goes, I'll be working there. Um, and where is your internship? Probably in Des Moines at Dos Rios and the catering business that that's connected to. And so are you interested in going to catering? Is that what you're interested in? I want to start off catering and then save up and start my own restaurant. Uh-huh. So you do want to work seven days a week, 365 days a year. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to have a family. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you can have one, but it's just, it's just, it's it, it, it is a challenge. Yeah, definitely a challenge. So, so that, that's great. So into catering at the beginning. And Ms. Kinsler, what about you? Um, I actually want to start my own catering business. I can't tell you how many times I jumped back and forth of what I wanted to do, own a restaurant, work as a head chef, completely drop culinary altogether. But now I think I finally decided that I want to run my own catering business. And how did you come to that conclusion? Um, I've catered a couple of my family's parties, um, a baby shower, a bridal shower, and my sister has a baby shower coming up that I'm catering completely, doing the decorations, the cooking, did the invitations, totally took that over, and I just really like doing it, so I think that's what I'm finally settling with. That's what I want to do. So that's really interesting because I don't think I've heard of anybody that I know of anyway that runs the complete thing other than a party planner who then hires out those different parts, but you, you actually are taking care of each one of them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try. That's... That's my plan. I mean, I know I'm not going to be able to do it all alone. So, of course, start small, maybe get bigger from there, maybe stay small. I haven't fully decided on that, but we'll see where it goes. Now, what I'm really curious about is, so far, you've got five months left of culinary school, right? And do you mind, mind just telling people a little bit about your schedule? Because I think that we've talked about it before, but people probably don't remember. What, what's it like? Because it's not like the nine-to-five job. 
Are you talking school or? School schedule. Okay. I mean, just school, we're up 6.30 because we live on campus. Some of our friends have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to drive to school. We're in class by 7 o'clock in the kitchens preparing whatever we're doing. Most of the time, we get half-hour lunch break, maybe a 10-minute break here and there to run to our next class. But we have class from 7 till about 4.45, 5 o'clock. And then I know Savannah and I personally work in the cafeteria at the school. So right at 5 o'clock, we run upstairs, go work in the cafeteria until 7, 7.30, whenever it gets done, cleaned up. Then we barely have time for homework. So, yeah, it's, it's stressful, but, I mean, it's what we love to do. That, that to me, is, is what I want to explore a little bit. So what has happened in terms of the development of your interest since you've been in culinary? Because you wanted to do it, right? Probably didn't have a complete idea of what it was going to be like. And so how, how has it all played out for you? Oh, so much more work has gone into it than I ever could have imagined. There are times you get so stressed out. All you want to do, call mommy. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit it. Got to call mom, relieve some of that stress. Oh, culinary. It's a lot on your feet. It's something I never imagined. I had worked in a restaurant part-time. That, that doesn't even prep you for real life, as we call it, for what it's actually going to be like. And as far as the the information is concerned, it, it just never stops, right? I mean, that's one of the things I was thinking about today. As much as people think that because I host a radio show about food that I know a lot about food, but the truth is I don't. I mean, I know a little bit, and I know a little bit about cooking, but the truth is that it's a field where you can't, if you're in it, you can't afford not to continue to learn, and if you love it, it's boundless in terms of what you can learn. Yeah, I agree with that fully. I mean, you've always got new chefs coming up with new ideas. There's new flavors coming out. Oh, have you tried chocolate-covered bacon, for instance, which came about a couple years ago? Who would have thought? I mean, it's popular now, really. But honestly, a couple years back, who would have thought of covering bacon in chocolate? You, you never know what's going to come around. That, that's true, and the latest food trends, maybe we'll get to that sometime during, during this uh, 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio because you're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. We're coming to you from hy V, and we want to thank them for the tremendous support of having the show in the club room. And Savannah, what do you think about what Kelly had to say in terms of your own personal experience with school? I totally agree. It's much more difficult than I would have ever thought. I thought when I first got there that I was just going to start off knowing what to cook and how to cook it. And you, if you think that, you're completely wrong and completely off your rocker. You learn so much that you would never even imagine. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, every day there's something new to learn. Can you give us a good example? (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) Let's yes, that's true. Right. I mean, think about who it is that's the director of the program, because Gordon Rader is an amazing person, and uh, he, he's never going to be satisfied with, with the amount of information that he's put out, and he's never going to be satisfied with what you know. No, he's always given us a new chef to look up. Have you seen this, this blog on my Facebook page about Charlie Trotter and... He's just always feeding us new information, and uh, it's to help us, honestly. I mean, first term, it drove me crazy because I was thinking, I have all this homework, I don't have time. But in reality, he's just trying to build us up, and I I appreciate it now. And it is interesting stuff, too. Yeah, it, it is really it really is fascinating. And there's su- such diversity in, in the world of, of, of chefs because uh, right now what I think is really fascinating is that uh, a lot of the chefs that are, that are getting uh, – recognition are chefs that are very and then it's been going on for a while but chefs that have we'll say really vivacious vivacious is not the right word personalities that are a little over the top how about that over the top you've got um, th- lots of lots of chefs like that what one of the mice just was it was it beheaded or its ear just got its ear poor little thing oh my gosh its ear just got you're gonna okay you're gonna call him loppy that's that's beautiful but i i think that that that's uh, when we think about chefs i personally think about people who are in their kitchen that's that's what's important to me is a chef that's in 
his or her kitchen. And a lot of times the superstar chefs that you see and you're familiar with, they don't have time to be in their kitchen because they're too busy doing all kinds of other things, uh, out, out having their name in front of the public. But at the same time, I, th- I think that if you can go to a restaurant where a chef is known for a particular type of cuisine and you can find that chef in that restaurant, that to me is always a, a real asset, I think. Now, what kind of, I'm interested to know in, in terms of your studies, what is it that you guys are working on now? Sometimes we review what, where, where you're at in the program. Well, we're focusing mainly on working on our scholarship dinner for January. Um, that's coming up really fast. We have to finalize the details and what we're going to cook. Um, well, and this is a dinner that you actually plan out yourselves? Yes. Um, my class does all the planning, all the cooking. Um, it's We do everything. Gordon has given us a few guidelines and things. But we basically do it all of our, all by ourselves. So. Do you find that the budgeting is one of the hardest parts of, the, of this? I mean, cooking is what we think about, but before you ever get there, you've got to be able to actually put together a budget, right, and procure the food and, and make sure that it, it comes in where the bottom line isn't affected or the bottom line is affected in a positive way. Yeah, that is so true. Um, cooking is just a very minute detail, Um, of what we have to do for this dinner. We have to order plates, um, order the food, think about costs, and um, what kind of product we want in. Not just the most expensive thing we can get just because we can, because school pays for it, but we have to think about what's best for everyone involved. I'm wondering, is there a technique that you are particularly drawn to in school in terms of cooking? Not really. I mean, there's different types of cuisine I'm particularly drawn to, like Asian and Mexican. I love those flavors. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, Kelly, what about you? Um, honestly, not That really. would be better than dishonestly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I like it all. I like trying the new flavors. Uh, I like baking. I like cooking. I... But molecular gastronomy, for example, or do you or do you like food a, as food as opposed to deconstructed? Or you like like, like food that too? Food. Mm-hmm. Molecular gastronomy kind of just goes over my head a lot of the times. So it's hard to follow, but it's still fun. It's interesting learning about what goes into food and taking it apart piece by piece. And it's all chemistry. Yeah, I agree. I agree fully with that. By the way, are you going to have any guest chefs coming this uh, next semester from, from Spain? You've had chefs over the last couple of years. Um, I believe for the scholarship dinner, Fatima is going to be in. <laughs> She'll be here for a month. Oh, well, hopefully she and Gordon will, will be having a really fun time together. <laughs> oh, I can imagine they will. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. She was on the show before, and it was a lot of fun. You know, having her here, she's an expert, a mycologist. So that that was really fascinating, actually having her around uh, here. So I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about some other trends that that have come up uh, over the past year. One of the most interesting things to me, and I don't know if if many of our listeners have been exposed to this, but there is this new, I don't want to say new, but there's this school of thought that's been going around where grains have become the bad guy. At, at different times, you know, there's different t- uh, schools of, of our fads, I guess, that come up in terms of diet. And now, this year, I've, I've at least been exposed to uh, numerous people who are just say, oh, no, no, you can't eat grains. You know, grains aren't good for you. And I start to think to myself, you know, but people have been eating grains for thousands of years. I don't think I understand, you know, why grains are the bad guys. And then, uh, actually, I do kind of realize what's happened. I think that it could simply be because of the fact that we have lost so much genetic diversity that some of the grains that people are exposed to over and over again, a lot of people have developed allergies to those grains because there's so few varieties left, for example, of wheat that's used on a regular basis that many people have become allergic to it. And so it isn't, 
I'd be, from an unscientific standpoint, I'd be willing to, to bet that it's not the, the wheat or the grain that's the uh, problem, but it's rather the fact that uh, there's been a loss of genetic diversity. Now, one of the great things is that so many people have, and so many young people are, are being, are being, uh, are getting involved in learning how to cultivate all kinds of different grains. And one of the things that uh, I found out about recently is that the green market in New York has been very big in promoting grains. And they even had a grain week back in November and where they focused on, on different types of grains. And there's so many fascinating grains that are out there, some of them that I've never even heard of before. Um, for example, uh, one that uh, is called uh, Frica. <laughs> which I got a kick out of. I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but Frika, pronounced Frika, uh, in Arabic is wheat that is harvested green and then roasted. It's been used traditionally in Middle Eastern countries and is also known in Germany as Grünkern, which is, literally means green grain, and it has a characteristic smoked aroma and a toasted, mildly sweet flavor. And that, to me, is, is fascinating. It has hardly any gluten, which is good for people who have some problems with gluten, and it's used in soups and stews. So there's lots of... Uh, it's funnily, funnily enough, what happens is that even though there's a lot of one end of the spectrum happening where people are... Uh, will say being told that grains are not a good thing. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of interest in finding more and more grains. And this year, for example, one of the most fascinating things that happened was einkorn pasta became a word that most more and more people were uh, exposed to, which is a, a form of wheat. Some say that it's the tr most traditional form of wheat, progenitor of wheat, that has been imported now from Italy and is being used in pasta and other types of applications. And it's a, it's a darker type of grain. And again, a lot of people who are allergic to wheat, some of them can actually eat this type of preparation, which is really interesting. All right, so you are making your turkey dressing right now, Kelly, and... So in that, we've got what? We've got ground turkey, we've got celery, and we've got bread. What is that? Those are... Uh, toasted pieces of bread. Toasted pieces of bread. Okay. And and what else do you have in there? So you've got herbs and spices? Mm -hmm. We threw in some sage, of course, and some rosemary and some oregano and garlic powder. Okay. And you're t basically, what are you doing? You're going to just keep toasting it in the pan? You've got a big, heavy iron skillet that you're using. I'm just trying to get all the bread moist, and then if it needs it, we'll throw it in the oven to dry it out just a little bit, but it shouldn't. So I'm confused a little bit. Uh, I'm confused a little bit now. So you're trying to get it moist, but if it needs to, you're going to throw it in the oven to dry out a little bit. Like if we get it too moist. If it's too soggy and just aha, so like the mush. perfect dressing. So the perfect dressing is what? Not too soggy, not too dry. <laughs> it'll, In between, it'll come together, but it's not mm. like mush. It'll still look like pieces of bread. And should it be sticky? Should it stick together or not? I like mine to stick. Okay, because people stick sometimes people it. serve it right, and it's a big clump Sorry. clump of you know it just holds together, right? And that's okay. I mean, when I, don't judge, but when I make the stovetop stuffing at home, I like it to stick to my fork. I just like to eat chunks of it. I, I may be weird, but, <laughs> but well, that's me. That's all right. We're, we're, we're okay with that. Now, I also see some couscous out here. What's going to happen with that? First of all, what is couscous? It's wheat. So that's that's not a problem. It's, 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 it's wheat that has been ground up into, like, it depends on, on what culture you're from because in, in the Middle East it can be in very large balls, actually. When I say large, I, 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 you know, maybe the size of your little pinky finger uh, at the tip. Like right. Ju like uh, Jerusalem couscous? Yeah, they had is Israeli Israeli couscous, couscous, right. Out there in Hy-Vee. Well, since Jerusalem is in Israel, you know, it works the same. Jerusalem okay. couscous or Israeli couscous. All right, so what are you going to do with that? I'm just bringing the vegetable stock to a boil, and then I'm going to add the couscous bring it back to a boil, then take it off the heat and let it sit covered for five to ten minutes, however long it takes for all the couscous to soak up 
every bit of moisture that's in there, and then I'm going to add the vegetables to it that I sautéed earlier. So that's pretty easy to do, right? You're, you're not even really cooking it. No, not really. <laughs> wow. Okay, so go up through, over that process one more time because that's something that anybody could do really quickly in their home kitchen. Oh, yeah. So you just take a cup of couscous to a cup and a quarter cup of vegetable stock or water or whatever kind of stock you want to use, and you bring the stock to a boil, then you add the couscous and bring it back to a boil, then remove it from the heat and let it stand for five minutes with the lid on. And that's it? That's it. Now, do you fluff it with a fork? Well, I'm going to add in the uh, uh, You're going to add in the vegetables first. Okay. It'll fluff. Okay, it'll fluff nicely. Sure it gets all the moisture out. Okay. And you can use prepared vegetable broth if you if you want to, or you can actually make your own. I love to make my own and then put it into ice cube trays, take it out of the ice cube trays and put it into bigger bags so that whenever I want to, I have vegetable stock to use uh, in whatever quantity you know I like to make it in. And I love to make it, I like to make it with really strong vegetables because one of the things about beef stock, chicken stock, fish stock, those types of things, they have a very strong flavor to them usually. And they add this base of flavor then to the dishes that you're, that you're doing. And so if you don't have a really good, strong vegetable stock, I think, you know, it doesn't really add any depth to, to what you're putting it into. So I like to use kale, for example, in my vegetable stock because I think it adds a lot of great flavor. I like to use parsley. Also in my vegetable stock, again, a lot of nice flavor. So those are the kind of really nice vegetable, really good vegetables that I like to put in there, along with garlic and onion and carrot and celery, uh, all those different things. And the most important thing, I think, or one of the most important things that you, you need to do is you need to saute those vegetables. You can't just throw them all in. Well, you can throw them all into a big pot of water, but you're going to get a lot more flavor if you've sauteed the vegetables and get them to caramelize a little bit. And actually, one of the methods that I know that has been employed before by Cooks Illustrated when they've uh, judged how to make the best vegetable stock is caramelizing the vegetables over and over again. In other words, caramelizing the vegetables and deglazing the pot, caramelizing the vegetables again, and deglazing the pot, and caramelizing the vegetables again to keep building up flavor layers. And I think that if you, if you Google it, you can probably find their their method uh, somewhere. America's Test Kitchen. Some people swear by America's Test Kitchen. Other people swear at America's Test Kitchen. So it's you know what, whatever whatever works for you. I think that's that's the best thing. Anyway, uh, I wanted to go back to some of the things that we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, some of the finds that I things that that I found over this year that have really meant something to me and. Uh, one of those things is the commitment of a particular chef to speaking out against genetic modification. Genetic modification is a hot button. A lot of people don't understand it. A lot of people think that there isn't anything to it. But basically, when we talk about genetic modification, G GMOs, genetically modified organisms, we're talking about taking a particular plant animal and changing it in some way, shape, or form at a genetic level. So, for example, if we, we have a, a genetically modified uh, piece of, um, if we have a genetically modified uh, fruit or vegetable, that fruit or vegetable would have been modified by actually taking some type of other genetic material and introducing it into the original plant or, or vegetable. Is that good? Is it bad? It depends who you talk to. Personally, I like the, if I'm going to eat a particular food, whether it's a vegetable or, or a piece of meat, I want to eat it as, at least I think it was supposed to be, supposed to be grown or served. I don't want to eat it with some, t some type of extra additional material, especially when it happens to be bacteria, which, by the way, is one of the things that they put into uh, one of the genetically modified organisms that goes into uh, other types of uh, plant uh, genetic material. And there are so many things that are going on right now in this particular field. For example, the FDA getting near and near to uh, proving genetically modified salmon. And many people who uh, are 
knowledgeable about this situation feel that what this will do is that it will eventually lead to the, the pollution of the wild salmon population because even though the salmon are supposed to be controlled, the genetically modified salmon are supposed to be controlled and not allowed out into, we'll say, the wild, those people who are campaigning against genetic modification of salmon say that that is just not something that can happen. You're, you're going to Something's going to happen, and these fish are going to get out there, and they're going to mix with the population of, of uh, pure wild salmon and change the entire ecosystem as, as far as that's concerned. To me, when I hear about all that stuff, I basically I don't get it. I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who looks at it from a real complicated you know, arena from, from a knowledgeable standpoint of having all the scientific information. But I'm really looking at it just from a strictly black and white area. If I want to eat salmon, I want to eat wild salmon. I don't want to eat farm salmon, which is not necessarily, that is not genetically modified. And I don't want to eat genetically modified salmon if genetically modified salmon happened to be approved. Anyway, going back to this, Tom Colicchio, who is the owner of a number of restaurants, Kraft being one of them, he, um, one of the, the places where he actually carved his reputation was Gramercy Tavern, one of Danny Meyer's restaurants in New York. And Tom Colicchio is probably, among chefs, one of the most outstanding spokespeople crusading against genetic modification. He's well known because he happens to be one of the judges on Top Chef and has been for many years. And every day you can find him using his Twitter account and other social media uh, options to crusade against uh, genetic modification of food. And so hats off to Tom for uh, doing that. And by the way, Connecticut, in case you don't know, Connecticut became the first state to actually pass a mandatory labeling law so that all genetically modified foods had to be labeled. Now, there are some, there are some restrictions to that law. It doesn't go into effect until other states, I think three or four other states, also pass a law. And I think the states might have to even be contiguous to Connecticut and have to have a certain number of, of uh, millions of people. But the bottom line is that the momentum, I think, is growing for the passage of genetically modified, uh, of having all labels show whether or not foods are genetically modified or not. And frankly, again, I, I don't understand what the big deal is about that. If I'm going to eat something, I want to know what's in it. These girls bought some interesting things on, on the shelves uh, and maraschino cherries being one of them. And, you know, I want to make a decision, my own decision, looking at the ingredients of the maraschino cherry and going, I'm going to bite the head off that mouse, uh, and, 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 and going whether or not, you know, I'm not sure I really want to eat that. Uh, and, and I don't feel like I'm, I know, I don't feel like I'm, uh, the other thing is I don't feel like I'm missing anything, though. So that, that's, that's important. If I felt like I was missing something, believe me, I would eat it. There's, there's no doubt about it. Hey, wine clubs. Wine clubs are something that really are fun if you happen to like wine, and it's something that you can get into. Mo many wine clubs, there's no charge at all to join a wine club. You basically, sometimes you have to make a commitment to buy a certain amount of wine, but it's usually very reasonable over a period of a year's time. So if you're interested in getting into and uh, learning more about the field of wine, I think that's a really great way to go about doing it. And the club that I happen to uh, find this year is a, a club in in uh, California that grows organically uh, grown grapes, grows their grapes organically, McFadden Farms, and they have uh, some really nice wines that are being grown in, in uh, uh, the... Uh, where are they grown? They're grown out in Mendocino County, Mendocino County, California. Now, a few other things that I found extremely useful. Kitchens end up usually with either too much or too little equipment. Sometimes you go into a kitchen and you can't cook anything because there's just nothing there that you can use. The knives aren't sharp if they even have the right kind of knives, which probably drives chefs crazy, right? Um, yes, most definitely. <laughs> the, the, uh, there's no cutting boards. There's, they're not the right pots and pans. They maybe they're, they're too thin instead of, uh, you know, really nice and, 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 and thick. Anyway, bottom line is you can have that situation. You can also have the situation where you just go into a kitchen and there's so much stuff you don't even know what to use. 
the other day I started cleaning out some of our drawers because I just started to look through all these different implements that I had and was like, well, what do I really use? And I put out on the countertop what I used, and that went back into the drawer, and the rest of it is going to be given away. Because I think that right now I'm in a phase of cooking where I just want to focus on what's easy and simple and also what I really need to have in my kitchen. So having said that, let me talk about a few things that I found to be really useful this year that some people might think are not necessary in a kitchen either. <laughs> and that was uh, some of them, uh, yeah, you may feel that they're, they're not that useful. Uh, my Bialetti espresso maker, absolutely fantastic. It's, it's, it's a great, great machine, and it's real simple. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any bells and whistles. It just makes a cup of espresso. It makes that with uh, pods that are 100% recyclable, totally different than running your espresso or coffee through plastic cups, which uh, a lot of the machines use, for example, and, and throw the hot water through that. So, so that's, that, that's a really simple, it's a simple way to make a really great cup uh, in the morning. Uh, another thing that I found really helpful is uh, my Omega juicer. Uh, Want to get fresh juice? Do it in a way that's really simple. Do it with a machine that takes up a little less room than a lot of the other machines that are out there. So uh, that that's a really good one to look into. The most wonderful thing that I've discovered this year is Zwilling Henkel's Spirit line of ceramic nonstick cookware. Oh, well, I'm glad you think so. That's great. Yeah, because because the whole thing about cooking is making the experience easy and wonderful. And a lot of people don't like nonstick cookware. I don't, I've never used it before, really. But this stuff is supposedly the, the latest in the technology as far as green cookware is concerned. It's a nonstick ceramic surface. So it's not what people are used to in terms of Teflon it's, or anything like that. And it's not supposed to have anything in it that can react and, and give you any kind of bad side effects over time. Um, but it's a terrific line of cookware, and, and it works perfectly. Very, very simple and easy to clean up. Gray Coon spoons. I, I've talked about Gray Coon spoons before. These are things that I really find useful for every single day in the kitchen. Gray Coons, K-U-N-Z. You can look it up. You can find those at the J.B. Prince website. So those are just some of the things that I found that are useful every day in the kitchen. And I have to say also that uh, some of these uh, manufacturers have been kind enough to contribute these items to Great Taste so that we can actually try them out. And I only talk about the things that I've actually found to be really, really excellent in the kitchen. I don't see any reason to talk about stuff that doesn't work. So the best thing is... Uh, to know what does work and you can enjoy your experience in the kitchen from that point. By the way, you're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar power voice of Fairfield, Iowa. And I want to mention, because a lot of people don't seem to know this, that Crew is a community radio station, and so Crew exists on donations. So if you like Great Taste, if you like other programs on Crew, I suggest that you go to the website, kruufm.com, and make a contribution. It's the perfect time of year to do that. Everybody's in the giving spirit. And just today I was told by the station manager that uh, a listener called up and said that they were contributing to the, show, uh, to the station because they loved the Great Taste show. So I'm not, you know, not patting uh, myself on the back or anything. Well, I could do that. All right. But, but I think that a lot of times we don't remember. NPR has all kinds of fun drives all, all year long, two or three times a year, where they do their fundraising. And because we're a little community radio station, people may not realize that it's all done on donations. So if you like Great Taste, if you like the other amazingly diverse programming that's on crew, go to the website, kruufm.com, and uh, make a donation. You can do it through PayPal. You can do it, uh, I think you can actually even do it on a monthly bet. You can. You can just make a monthly donation, whatever it is, $5 a month, $10 a month, or if you happen to win the lottery, you can do a lot more than that. That'll be, that'll be perfect. All right, what's going on here? We are mixing the vegetables into the couscous right now. So it's really simple. You made the couscous, you put the vegetable, you had sauteed the vegetables. Previously, you've got red peppers and you, yellow peppers and green peppers and mushrooms and onions. And is it going to be asparagus? Mm -hmm. Asparagus? You, is asparagus local right now? Is it? Is it? I don't think so. Anyway, anyway, asparagus oh, is in the... Hmm? 
<laughs> I meant squash. Aha, uh-huh, better. Okay, squash. Excellent. And and so now, what is this going to have a sauce to it or anything like that? Nope. No. Okay. <laughs> so it's just going to be a, <laughs> sautéed vegetables, couscous, and some delicious salt, pepper, and and other herbs and spices. Of course. Okay. And it smells delicious already. All right. I'm glad to hear that. I wish that those of you who are listening to the show could actually see this tray full of mice. But I'll, I'll be curious to see how many people actually eat it. So that, that, that'll, be, that'll be my uh, my thing. I want to make sure that I mentioned before we get off the air here that there was a, a talk of a dish that turned out terrific, and I want to hear about this. I'm almost scared to mention it here. Blueberry and <laughs> blueberry and uh, what, what kind? Porcini mushroom lasagna, right? Who who did you tell me about that? Yeah, one of our classmates is making it for the scholarship dinner. Um, it's really good. It's a secret. It's a secret? Oh, okay. So the, the deal, blueberry and porcini mushroom lasagna. So it's stu- the layers have blueberries and porcini mushrooms in between them? Yeah. Is there a bechamel sauce or what? There is, and it's got parmesan and I think asiago in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'll tell you what. I want you to save us a piece, you know, put it in the freezer and bring it, you know, next time because we we want to hear we want to we want to really want to hear that because the scholarship dinner is only eighty five dollars a plate. And when is it? January twenty fourth, I believe. It's a what day is it? <laughs> Shoot. All right. When you guys get the information, when you guys get the information, let me know because, of course. Uh, even though we can't normally tell people to go out and buy things like this, this is co- this is a lot different because this is supporting a an educational institution, right? Exactly. Right. Perfect. So contribute to Indian Hills. You can contribute to Crew, and those of you who want to contribute to me, I'll be around after this show. All right. So, <laughs> anybody have? By the way, anybody have any really interesting eating plans for the holidays? Are you cooking dinner? Huh. You cooking I want anything? To. Mm-hmm. I hope so. I'm maybe lunch, but we usually go and have a big family dinner with my entire family that lives here in Iowa for some reason. So we're all just. You find that strange? <laughs> <laughs> they all just kind of came to Iowa, <laughs> but yeah, we all just kind of bring a dish, and that's how that one goes. So I won't get to cook a whole lot for that, but maybe just our small immediate family. I'll be able to cook for. Well, that'll be fun, I'm sure. Uh, I'm we we go over to a neighbor's on on Christmas Eve. It's always a lot of fun, and there's always great food. And then on Christmas Day, I think I might have mentioned this before. I make pizza. Don't come over. I lock the door. Uh, <laughs> so, but but I'm really, I'm really it's, just go to Lincoln Cafe or Lincoln Wine Bar because their pizza is great, and you know mine's okay. But but there's there's is actually a lot better. So you, you can enjoy it there. Oh, one of the other things that I've really want to mention to to, uh, all of the listeners is if you don't really think too much about cheese please do because the diversity of cheeses that's available in this country today is absolutely amazing and it's just getting more and more and today i i uh, came across a cheese that it's it's not new but it was new to me and that was a cheddar blue Something that's, when you think about blue cheese, you don't really think about cheddar blue cheese. And this is a cheddar blue being made in Wisconsin. Absolutely outrageous and amazing. So take a look at cheese. That's another thing that I've really uh, enjoyed exploring more and more this this past year and plan on putting more attention on it uh, in 2014. By the way, speaking of 2014, there are no more live shows until January 28th. That'll be our first live show. But there's going to be a new great taste, I think, basically every Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday at 7 p.m. on streaming KRUUFM.com and Friday at 7 a.m. on Crew. Uh, new great taste every Wednesday and Friday because I've done a lot of interviews over the past few weeks. And so uh, you'll be able to enjoy those interviews uh, on the air, even though we won't be having any live shows until the end of the month. And hopefully I'll have lots of interesting things to report to you about food that I've eaten 
while I was on the road in January, while I'm on the road in January, right? All right, any questions that anybody has for our, our listeners? Not our listeners, that wouldn't work. Any questions anybody has for Savannah or Kelly or myself? Yes, for you, Steve. So we're, not, we're, we're doing our show the last Wednesday in January. Could we, are we going to talk about food trends? Every year they talk about what are the trends. And the thing I like to take as approach is what did they talk about last year and what is, what is happening now? So it's restaurant trends, it's grocery trends, it's dishes that come out of what Savannah and Kelly were talking about, you know, the Gordon Raider at Indian Hills talks about. What's new? Go watch this show. Go read this interview. Things happen. And how long does it take for something to become a trend? Like really good pizza took a while, but then it took off. When does it hit the tipping point? And when does it actually go the other way? Yeah, and when does it go the other way? That's a good thought. I like it. Let's do that for the 28th. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about the trends of at least the trends for 2014. And we'll talk about uh, some of the things. W- one of the big things that's going on is Asian. That's, that's just continuing to grow more and more. And I noticed in an article, I think you might have sent me an article and I, and I saw some other articles that uh, Asian is still like really at the top, you know, in terms of the, the trends uh, more and more. I, I think one of the reasons is that it's so interesting and diverse in terms of the different kinds of flavors that you can put together. And also it's healthy, generally speaking. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a healthy type of cuisine. So it, it's, it's, it's going to be fun, Tom, and we'll, we'll definitely explore that. So tell, me, tell us a little bit about cabbage. <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> well, <laughs> tell us about your cabbage. Where did you get this recipe? Um, my mom always makes it around Christmas. My sister and my brother love it. I used to hate it, but I love it now, now that I like cabbage. <laughs> so these are stuffed cabbage rolls? Yes, it's got ground beef. I already told you this. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, but you know what? People heard that 57 <laughs> minutes ago. They don't even remember. Okay, it's got ground beef, onion soup mix, <laughs> um, rice, stewed tomatoes, and tomato juice. All right, and you can actually make that yourself in a really good fashion by making your own broth, your own onion soup. Of course, that's going to take a lot longer, right? And your house is going to smell for days, but it'll smell delicious, so it's not a problem. Anyway, cabbage, I I recommend that people really get get a little taste and enjoy cabbage because it's it's so simple to use, and it's it's really good. It's really good and healthy and hearty in the wintertime. All right. Ladies, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Really glad to have you. Uh, wishing you a great holiday and a happy new year. And we'll see you at the end of January. And now you have your assignment for that time. I want to thank everybody who's contributed to the show this past year. Hi V, Tom Allen, Emily Shaw, the Fairfield Media Center. And if I've forgotten anybody, of course, all the listeners, we really appreciate all of your contributions and uh, all of your input. I'm Steve Boss. You've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. 60 minutes of delicious radio. Great Taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste.